morning or good afternoon, whatever the case may be. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. Um, uh, I really am glad you came. I'm glad that they're doing this big activity. Obviously, the, the division between fake news and real news is, is getting blurred more and more these days. So any opportunity where people will come, even voluntarily, um, and not even just for the extra credit, uh, is really good to learn about a new thing and, and hopefully get, a, get an idea for, for how these things really work. Um, when I started thinking about free trade and the issue of international trade, I, I inevitably started thinking about Harry Truman, right? The President of the United States, just a little bit after World War, actually uh, right at the end of World War II, he took over. Um, and and uh, Harry Truman is famous for saying a lot of things. He was really a man of words and, and a lot of quips. And one of his quips has really uh, stood out for me, and it's this one. He said, could anyone give me a one-handed economist? Um, the idea is that basically he had just met with an economist about the economy and then he went back and he's talking to his advisors and his advisors are saying, well, Mr. President, how was your meeting? He goes, well, it was fine. They said, well, did you learn anything? He goes, well, yeah, I guess I did. And they said, well, what, 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 what do you really need now? He goes, well, I think what I need is a one-handed economist. Well, why? Why would you need a one-handed economist? He says, because whenever you're talking to an economist, the story you always get is, well, on the one hand, this will happen, and on the other hand, this will happen, right? And so you never quite get the straight story. He never would know exactly what policy to follow because the economist would always be doing this on the one hand, on the other hand kind of thing. And so I kind of realized that that's sort of the argument back and forth about free trade. When you hear free trade, it almost always comes down to this, this issue of trade-offs, right? There, there are a lot of benefits to be had for free trade, uh, from free trade. There are also some dangers or some, some, some demerits that happen as a result of free trade. And so when you're talking about this issue, there's always this trade-off, this kind of on the one hand and on the other hand. Um, so I wanted to start actually with a little demonstration of just how trade works. And so, um, I want to sort of see this group over here as a group, and uh, um, uh, if you could, um, uh, Alex, now I have to fix, get the name in my head. Here, pass these out so that everyone in your group gets, gets a candy or gets one, all right? And this is one group, and then this will be the other group. All right, and, and Alex, I'm going to make you the group leader, all right? And Levi, I'm going to make you the group leader for over here. Did everyone get one? Yeah. All right. Uh, oh. You like this one? All right. Now, hold on to your chocolate. Don't give it away. Don't open it. Don't eat it. I just want you to look at it for a second. <laughs> I want you to think. Have you eaten yours already? No? OK. So I want you to think about how much you like the chocolate you got. Sort of think about it in comparison to the chocolate that your neighbors have. Do you like your chocolate? If you got the one that's your favorite of all chocolates in the world, well, then you'll be very happy. And what I want you to do is think about a point value that you would give to the chocolate that you currently have. How happy does that chocolate make you on a scale of, let's say, um, one to five, right? So if the chocolate you've got is your favorite kind of chocolate anyway, then you'll give that chocolate a five. If the chocolate you got is, is like the peanut M&Ms and you're allergic to peanuts, then you'll give that a one. Uh, you still don't give it a zero because at least you got something, right? Um, think about the number that you have in your head that you associate with that chocolate. Now, does everyone have one? All right. Now, what I would like Alex to do is, Alex, I want you to go to your group and make a sum total of all the, the point values. So add up all the points and tell me what the total number of happiness points for your group is for their chocolates. Okay, so go around and Levi, I want you to do that the same for your group. Ask each person how much their chocolate is worth to them. Okay, you got a number? Don't tell me. All right, but you got that number. Don't forget it. It's in there? 
Got it, Levi, you got your number? Awesome, all right. Now, what I'd like you to do is now, if you see someone with a chocolate you want, trade with them. If they'll make the trade, if they'll exchange for the chocolate you've got. No, you can turn around to the guys behind you. You could even cross groups a little bit. Yeah, well. All right. All right. So they, I mean, this should really be like in the pits at Wall Street, but they're like, I got an M and M's. I got an M and M's. Anyone selling M and M's? <laughs> right. All right. So you've made your trade. All right. Now, now, group leaders, Levi, Alex, I want you to go around, and I want everybody else now to think, what's the value of your new chocolate? Right? Does your new chocolate? make you equally happy as the old one? Does it make you happier? And rank that new chocolate now before you eat it on a scale of one to five. And group leaders, go around and figure out the sum happiness level within your groups. All right, we good? All right. Um, Levi, what was the number before people made the trades? 29. 29. And what's the number now? 35. 35. Oh, that's not bad. That's, um, yeah, that's pretty good. All right. So, so they went from 29 to 35. Alex, how about your group? 31 to 35. 31 to 35. So also an increase. Yeah. Um, did anyone trade chocolates? Who traded? I'm always on my Oh. <laughs> oh. It went up? That's yeah, what's key. All right, good. Jimmy, um, why did you trade? Uh, well, I feel like M&Ms, I have them a lot, so they're really not that valuable to me. Uh-huh, and Something like extra caramel. Uh-huh. Like, that's really valuable to me. Got it. And how much did you value the M&Ms that you had? And now you got a five. A five. That's pretty good for you. Yeah. All right, uh, very good. Anyone else trade? Yeah, Levi? Uh huh. And so you traded with Colin. For a Butterfinger, got it for five. And so you went from a one to a five. And Colin. Went two to four. You went from a two to a four. So you also ended up better. Did anyone end up worse? Huh. That's pretty cool, right? Notice there's a result of free trade, right? Nobody ended up worse. Did anyone end up the same? You you ended up the same, you guys. Everybody didn't trade. All right, so some of you ended up the train. Nobody's worse off, though, right? You don't even, unless you're just kind of a nasty kind of person, you don't even feel bad that other people around you got better off while you stayed the same, right? Well, that's good, right? So clearly trade is good. Clearly just uh, trade either kept happiness the same or increased it for everybody, right? It did one of those things for everybody. And group-wise, there was no group that was worse off, right? Everybody was better off. Well, actually, there was no individual that was worse off. Everybody either stays the same or does better as a result of trade. Well, that's one of the key concepts here, right? That's something that goes on with free trade, and that is basically undeniable, right? I don't want to say that anything's undeniable, but that's a pretty solid truth in social science today, and it underpins our thinking about free trade. So I want to talk today a little bit about the theory of international trade. How does it work when you do the kinds of trades that you guys just did on the international level? Then I want to talk a little bit about international trade in practice. About then we'll be halfway through the talk, so that's when you can take your chocolate break and that'll sort of hold you through. Um, and then finally I want to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of protectionism. Actually, you can eat your chocolate now, you can save it for later. I'm done with chocolates. <laughs> for those of you who have started chewing, you don't have to just <laughs> hold it in your mouth for the rest of the lecture. All right, so how does international trade work in theory? Well, it actually works a whole lot like the trade demonstration worked in this room. I want you to think about the United States. In the United States, it turns out that we have a very good wine industry. In California, they make very good wine. Uh, arguably, it's even better than French wine. Don't tell French people that. They will freak out, but it happens to be true. American wine is really 
really good. Has anyone ever had Canadian wine? <laughs> There's a reason for that. It's not that good. I mean, no slag on anyone who's from Canada. I like Canada very much, but it just turns out that they're not very good at making wine. It's a little too cold up there for the grapes to do well, so the, and, the, and the growing season is shorter, and they've got to use varieties of grapes that don't put forth uh, you know, the same amount of stuff. And so for the same amount of effort, they don't get nearly as much wine, and that wine isn't nearly as good. And so as a result, wine in Canada is more expensive and not as good as wine in the United States. Well, this is something that we call comparative advantage, right? When it comes to wine, the United States has a comparative advantage <coughs> relative to Canada, right? We can make wine better and cheaper than Canadians can, and it's really just a result of our natural conditions here, our climate, our practices, our laws, and all kinds of things like that. Now, of course, there's something in Canada. If there wasn't, nobody would live there. And it turns out that in Canada, they make really good maple syrup. Now, it turns out that we can ma make maple syrup here in Indiana, but I hate to admit this as somebody who right now, my trees are dripping sap right now, and I do this myself. I like my maple syrup a lot, but if I'm really honest with myself, it's not as good as the Canadian stuff, right? And what's more, it takes me a lot more effort to do it. My trees don't release the same amount of sap each day as the same Canadian tree would. Um, the sap that they give forward is very watery, and so I have to boil it down more than the Canadian trees would have to do, or than you would have to do with the Canadian trees. And so our maple syrup is not as good, and it's not as cheap as Canadian maple syrup, right? And so when it comes to maple syrup, Canada has a comparative advantage relative to us, right? For them, maple syrup is better and cheaper than maple syrup is here for us. And so this is where international trade comes in. This is where that benefit comes in, that idea that you had a Babe Ruth and you didn't really like Babe Ruth, but he had a Butterfinger and you like that better. And he had the Butterfinger, which he didn't care for as much as he liked the Babe Ruth that you had. Well, you can trade. Well, if free trade becomes available, if the blockages that would have occurred for free trade between the United States go away, well, Canadians aren't dumb, right? They're going to know that Americans like maple syrup, and they're going to know that any thinking person is going to prefer maple syrup that's better and cheaper to maple syrup that's more expensive and not as good. And so Americans are going to look at that big, juicy, beautiful maple syrup in Canada. The maple syrup makers in Canada are going to look at that big, juicy market for maple syrup in America, and it's going to be love at first sight, right? The maple syrup makers in Canada are going to double their production, and they're going to start sending their maple syrup to the United States. Suddenly, the United States will have the good wine it always had, and it will now have good maple syrup to boot. Um, well, of course, it works the other way in reverse. M Canadians, they like wine. It's the only thing that keeps you warm enough in the, the winter and even their spring and fall, which is pretty miserable as well. So they see our really good wine. The American winemakers see this big, nice market up in Canada. And so they double their wine uh, uh, production. It's not quite double, but you get what I mean. And they'll send their excess wine to Canada. And notice what happens, right? As a result of free trade, both wine and maple syrup are both better and cheaper in both the United States and Canada, right? In a way, everybody is better off because of free trade, just like in this room, right? You either were the same, if you didn't care for maple syrup or wine in the first place, you're just neutral, right? But everybody else is either, is, is, is better off, right? People in both the United States and Canada get both maple syrup and wine that's both better and cheaper as a result of free trade. And so we have Adam Smith who says that it's not from the benevolence of the vintner or from the tapper that, that each gets their dinner, but from the, uh, you know, the self-interest of each. And this is really an interesting concept. I, I, I revised the statement a little bit. Um, uh, Adam Smith, I think, originally was talking about bread and beer, which are also very good things. Um, but in any case, right, notice that it doesn't require that Americans be generous or even like Canadians to do this. 
We could dislike Canadians, and it would still be in our interest to trade with them because we're not giving them good wine for free. We're giving them good wine that we have extra of for good maple syrup that we don't have. And so there's a real advantage to this, and it's amazing how it works. It even works when people don't like each other. All you have to be is self-interested, and the whole plan comes together. All right, and notice that, right? After free trade, Canadians get maple syrup and wine, uh, both of which are good, right? Whereas before, they had maple syrup that was good, but their wine wasn't nearly as good. Americans, after free trade, have both good wine and good maple syrup. That's better than good wine and bad maple syrup, which is what they had before. And so free trade, and by the way, I'll be clear when I'm telling you my opinion, right, on this, on this day of, of understanding and teaching and, 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 and sort of cutting through the fake news that's out there. This is not really Hollander's opinion. This is true, right? This is very well established fact that in both the United States and Canada, both maple syrup and wine will be both better and cheaper as a result of free trade. So what could go wrong? Well, let's talk about how this actually works in practice, because of course, things don't always work in practice quite so well as they work in theory. Because it turns out that I lied to you. I was lying a little bit. Um, I was lying in a way that you guys mo might not recognize because you're a little younger. It was a very sort of old-fashioned, quaint kind of lie like we used to make. Uh, nowadays, you, you lie by just making stuff up out of thin air. This wasn't that kind of lie. This was what we used to call a lie of omission, right? I didn't lie by telling you something that wasn't true. I lied by not telling you something that was, right? And what was that? Well, remember those guys? What happened to them? I mean, I said that everybody got better off in both the United States and Canada. They, they didn't get better off. If you made wine in Canada, you suddenly found yourself outsold by this cheap, better American wine. And so you had to buy a lot of that wine to drink away your sorrows because your winery has now closed, <laughs> right? And American wine uh, maple syrup makers might be drowning themselves in good Canadian maple syrup, but it doesn't make up for the loss of having lost your industry, right? And so there are losers from free trade, and while it's true that on average Canadians are better because of free trade, what that means is that there are a bunch of people who got better off and a few people who got worse off. And so on average, Canadians got better off, but there are some Canadians who got worse off, and it's the same here in the United States, right? Americans in general did better because of free trade. Winemakers in America did very well because of free trade, but maple syrup makers in America lose their job. Now, in theory, some of them might go into wine, to, to, to wine production. Former maple syrup makers in America might start making wine. But just because the winemakers double their production doesn't mean they have to double the number of people they employ, right? And so there's definitely going to be a loss on each side. There's going to be an overall gain on each side, a net gain on each side, but there are going to be losers. And if you're one of those losers, you often don't want to hear these theoretical argument, arguments about how free trade is good for everybody. It certainly wasn't good for you. All right, and so this is what Karl Marx refers to as the destructive power of capitalism, right? For capitalism to produce, it also has to destroy. There are individuals who will get worse off even because of free trade. All right, now let's look at some industries that are maybe a little bit more realistic. We've looked at wine, we've looked at maple syrup, uh, automobiles, pharmaceuticals, these work a little different, and these are good local industries, right? There's a big local automobile industry. We're not far from Michigan. We border on it, right, which is where the, that was the heart of the American car industry. But, of course, there are car manufacturing plants in, in Lebanon, Indiana, right? 20 minutes away, there's a huge Subaru factory. And, of course, our library isn't called the, Le the, the Lilly Library for nothing, right? Indiana is also the home to Eli Lilly, a major pharmaceutical producer. Now, pharmaceuticals and cars are very different. They're very different from each other, and they're very different 
from these goods over here, from things like maple syrup and like wine. Maple syrup and wine are things that Karl Marx would say are land intensive, right? They use a lot of land. It takes a lot of land to grow a lot of maple trees and collect a lot of maple syrup. Same thing for making um, wine, right? You need to have a lot of land to make these things. In relative terms, it doesn't take quite as many people. Now, cars work differently, right? Cars rely on a lot of labor. They are labor-intensive industries. If you own a car factory and you have twice as much land, that doesn't help you produce twice as many cars, right? It might help a little bit. You might be able to expand your factory a little bit, but it doesn't help nearly as much as doubling the size of your workforce, which might allow you to really make twice as many cars or even more, right? And then, of course, we have pharmaceuticals. Those are capital-intensive industries, right? You need a lot of money to invest in, in pharmaceuticals right up front. You need workers who have a lot of education, a lot of specialized knowledge to make pharmaceuticals. Okay, well, so imagine now trade between the United States and Mexico, and now we're talking trade, not maple syrup and wine, but automobiles and pharmaceuticals. Well, um, since automobiles are labor intensive, if we want to know what's going to happen to automobiles in a world of free trade, we might as well look at what's going to happen to the labor uh, that goes into making automobiles uh, in this situation. So let's look at American workers and what they work for, and let's look at Cana uh, uh, Mexican workers and what they work for. Uh, what is the minimum wage for a U.S. worker? 7.25 an hour, absolutely, right? An American worker will make $7.25 an hour. Anyone know what the minimum wage in Mexico is? It's $4 a day. Wow, right? If you're in a place where they measure workers, wa workers' wages in terms of days instead of hours, that is some cheap labor. And American automobile manufacturers know that. And so when free trade comes in, what do you think is going to happen? Well, auto workers in the United States, auto, no, no, not the workers, I take that back. Automobile manufacturers in the United States are going to look at Mexico and they're going to say, what the heck, right? If we can start making our cars in, in Mexico versus here, then we'll only have to pay our workers $4 a day instead of $7.25 an hour. We can keep a lot more money ourselves, and we can sell our cars for cheaper. This is going to be a whole of a heck of a lot better. And so American manufacturers of cars are going to move to Mexico. And for similar reasons in the opposite direction, pharmaceutical manufacturers are going to move their operations to the United States. More or less, American pharmaceutical companies will double their production and sell that excess pharmaceutical to, to Mexico. And so Mexicans now will have pharmaceuticals that are better and cheaper than they used to be. And of course, American manufacturers of automobiles will move to Canada. Excuse me, Canada, I'm still on Canada. Will move to Mexico. And that means that in essence, uh, automobile production in Mexico will double. And those extra automobiles will be sold in the United States. So Americans now will get automobiles that are cheaper and better than they used to get. Right? That same good result from trade, but it's not entirely good, right? There's an on the other hand, right? What happens to those people? Well, it's not so good for them, right? Thousands of American automobile workers are going to lose their job. Now, it's not entirely bad. Remember, like pharmaceutical production goes up in the United States, but since pharmaceuticals use fewer workers, we may gain a hundred new jobs at the loss of a thousand jobs. That's not exactly a good trade. And it's going to feel really bad for those 900 extra people who no longer have a job. And guess what? It's going to feel really bad for the politicians in whose districts those 900 workers or former workers live. Now, of course, Mexico is happy, right? I mean, that's going to make the American worker really, really angry. But notice what happens in Mexico. In Mexico, things go up. Arriba, right? That means up in Spanish, and it is up for Mexicans, right? They are in very good shape as a result of that. Sure, 
They might lose a hundred pharmaceutical jobs, but they're going to gain a thousand car jobs, and that's a really good thing for them. So notice that if I'm going to be a humanist about this and not an Americanist, this is a good result. I mean, Mexicans need to work just like we do. And so the overall happiness in the world, it hasn't gone down. In fact, arguably it's gotten better. Arguably, Mexicans needed the jobs more than we did. Um, and it's a really sad thing for those American workers, those 900 people in this example who lost their jobs. But it's also a really good thing for those 900 Mexican people who now got their jobs. And, and if I'm just a humanist about this, if I'm thinking about the world, that's almost just a wash. And in the meantime, for non-workers, for just consumers in both the United States and in Mexico, both cars and, and pharmaceuticals are now both better and cheaper. So you get an overall elevation in happiness all over the place. And then you get a very specific huge gain for a bunch of people in Mexico and a, small, and, a, and, a, and a huge loss, it should be said, but for a small number of people in Mexico and a huge gain uh, for a few people in the United States and a, and a pretty huge loss for, for a lot of people in the United States as well. Right? And so suddenly you're going to get calls for how about protecting the American worker? Can we do something to protect the American worker in a scenario like this? And as soon as a politician hears this word, that politician's going to come up and say, did I hear protection? Did I hear this word? Did I hear that there are people whose jobs are threatened in a swing state? Uh-uh, not under my watch. I'm not going to let that happen. So what is protectionism? Protectionism or a protectionist policy is a policy that a country can implement that protects its industry from, from imports from a country that has a comparative advantage in that particular good that's being produced. Right? Now, a classic form of protectionist trade barrier is something called a tariff. I'll explain this. There are actually a whole bunch of protectionist measures that politicians can, can, can implement. But tariffs are, are, are really a very popular one. They're popular because politicians actually like tariffs. It's kind of a little popular thing. Um, so we went back to our, our, our example here. The United States has a comparative advantage when it comes, you know, in relation to Canada, when it comes to the creation of wine. So trade barriers come down, and all of a sudden, um, you see those American winemakers, and they know that it might cost them $10 a bottle to make the wine that they make. Now, if that's the case, that means that when they bring their wine to Canada and they try to sell it, they have to sell it for at least $10 if they're going to make a profit. Well, that's not a problem, right? Because Canadian wine is selling for $11 a bottle. Those American winemakers, right, they can, move to, they can sell their wine in Canada. They can sell it for $10.50. They'll make a nice uh, profit, and they'll still be underselling all that Canadian wine on the shelf. It's a really attractive deal for them, so as soon as those trade barriers come down, they're going to run and try to sell their wine in Canada. But they're going to be stopped, right? They might be stopped by a Canadian politician who cares about the wineries in his or her district, right? And if you're a Canadian politician, you're going to be scared for the sake of your people, that is to say your voters, right? who are not going to be happy if they lose their wineries to a bunch of you know, Americans who are selling cheap, albeit good, wine. And so the Canadian might say, well, sorry, that'll be $2 a bottle, eh? <laughs> Notice what happens now, right? In the world before, for an American winemaker to sell wine in Canada, you had to sell that wine for at least $10 to make a profit. Now you have to sell it for at least $12 to make a profit because it cost you $10 to make the wine and it cost you two extra dollars that you're paying to the Canadian government to bring your wine to Canada. That's what a tariff is. A tariff is, is a tax that a government will charge on imported goods. And notice how this is in a way a win-win for a politician. Now for American wine to sell in Canada, it's got to sell for at least $12 for the American winemakers to make a profit. 
Well, certainly there are some Canadians that'll pay $12 or more for good American wine, but now there are gonna be some Canadians that look at their cheaper Canadian wine and say, well, it's cheaper, it may not be as good, but I might take some of that, and the, um, the, the Canadian wine industry might survive longer or better than it otherwise would. And guess what, that two extra dollars, it goes to the Canadian government. And so the Canadian politicians are happy to get their $2 a bottle and also happy to protect their very own wine industry. Right? And so that's what a tariff is. Of course, if Canada charges tariffs that are too high on American goods, what's going to happen? Well, America will start charging tariffs on the importation of Canadian maple syrup, and our bad maple syrup will persist longer than it otherwise should. All right, so that's a tax that politicians can really get behind. Because think about what's happening, right? When a Canadian politician taxes imports, they get to use that tax money for their own citizens, but they're charging the tax to other people. Now, they're charging it to their own people indirectly because some of their goods, namely American wine in Canada, gets more expensive. But on the whole, tariffs are really attractive for politicians, certainly on the short term and certainly in localized little areas with, with, with industries that need protection. There are other things like import quotas and various workarounds like regulations and subsidies and currency uh, 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 manipulation. All these things are a little easier to hide than a tariff, um, but they, they nonetheless also impede free trade. All right, and so that's why countries make free trade agreements with each other, right? They basically set up things like NAFTA or the Trans Pacific uh, par uh, Trade Partnership, right? These ideas where a group of countries will get together and agree to limits on how high their tariffs can be. They can agree to procedures for how to resolve differences between them if one, Canada, if, if one country wants to try to, to do some kind of protectionist measure. These things will prevent protectionist measures from getting out of hand. They'll protect the sort of retaliatory protectionist measures where one country tries to protect its industry and then in retaliation the other country tries to protect its industries. That's what we call a trade war, right? And in theory, things like NAFTA and the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership should make this not happen. Uh, you may know just recently, a couple weeks ago, uh, President Trump signed us out of the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And it was reported in the media that he killed it that he killed the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was not true. He didn't kill it. It's going to survive alive and well. We just won't benefit from it. But, right, there are probably some American workers somewhere who are very happy that he did that. Right? So there's that on the one hand and that on the other hand kind of thing. So, uh, trade agreements hurt workers, right? We've already seen some of the pros and cons of free trade. Right? We've seen that trade agreements hurt workers. We've seen that trade agreements help consumers. And politicians, of course, are going to come up there and say, when they're talking to protectionists, oh, when they're talking to workers, I've always been out to protect the American worker. And the politicians are also going to go to regular consumers and say, I'm always there for the American consumer. Right? They're going to say uh, whatever it is they need to say for the audience they're talking to, and as a result, Democrats and Republicans have done uh, arguably more flip-flopping on free trade tha than on any other issue, right? They are equal opportunity flip-floppers when it comes to free trade, and why not, right? Because there are a bunch of, if there are a bunch of workers in a swing state that are about to lose their job, suddenly protectionism looks like a good idea. But if protectionism hurts the economy as a whole, well, then it's not a good idea. And so depending on who you talk to. So the pros and cons of free trade, we saw some of those already, right? Uh, uh, you're going to have people like Adam Smith who says that trade helps the American consumer. He's right. You're going to have Karl Marx who says that trade hurts the American worker. He's right. But then there's a response, right? There's always still another on the other hand. And so you can see Adam Smith saying, well, maybe in the short term, Carl, maybe in the short term, you're right. But on the other hand, free trade even helps the American worker. Now, this is odd. How is it good to lose your job? Well, it might be. Because think about it this way. First of all, 
in just a very basic sense, workers are consumers too, right? If you're a worker and you like to eat maple syrup and you like to eat wine, right? Well, if you were in a situation, if you're an American worker and you were in a situation where you had good wine but bad maple syrup and free trade begins and as a result that bad maple syrup is replaced with good maple syrup, well that's going to make for a happy consumer and some of those workers are also consumers. They're going to on the whole be happier, right? And now of course maple syrup doesn't look like that important of an issue, but, but maple syrup's pretty important. It's pretty darn good, right? But even more than that, of course, we're not just talking about maple syrup. We're not just talking about wine. If you've gone to Walmart and all that stuff is really cheap, they don't make stuff that cheap without making it somewhere else. They don't make stuff that cheap without making it a place where you pay workers by the day instead of by the hour. Right? And so workers, even if they get laid off, are at least going to survive a little better because the goods that they need are going to be cheaper. But in the long term, there's an argument made by supporters of free trade that free trade actually helps workers find new jobs. Now there might be some little transition period, but in the long run, people like Adam Smith would argue free trade even helps those workers who got laid off. Now, how does that happen? Well, all of you guys, I suspect, in the next 10 years will buy a car. But here's the little trick, right? That car that you guys are going to buy in, in, within the next 10 years is going to be cheaper because of free trade than it would be otherwise, right? Remember, because of free trade, our cars are better and cheaper than they would have been without free trade. And so let's say that a car was going to cost you $16,000, but with free trade, with those car companies making their cars in Mexico versus the United States, they can now sell you the same car for $14,000. Well, that extra $2,000 doesn't just disappear. It means that instead of buying your car, you're going to have the economic equivalent of your car plus $2,000 because that same car cost you less money than it otherwise would have cost you. Well, you don't just leave that $2,000 in the bank. You'll probably spend it. So what's going to happen if in 10 years you get a car and the car doesn't cost $16,000 but instead costs $14,000? Well, you're going to buy that car and then you're going to use that $2,000 and you're going to do things that you otherwise wouldn't have done. You might go to dinner. Well, that means that restaurants have to hire more waiters and more cooks and more dishwashers, right? You might renovate your house, and that means that you're going to have to hire more construction workers and painters and things like that. Heck, you might use that $2,000 to go back to college, right? And that means, and that's a really good thing, right? Because then colleges have to hire more professors. And by the way, it means that once you're finished getting your new college degree, you can go back and get an even better job than you had previously. Right? And so in the long term, supporters of free trade would argue, uh, yes, workers may hurt when they initially get laid off, but if the economy as a whole does better because of free trade, then even those workers will eventually do better. Yeah, in theory. But Karl Marx doesn't buy it. So take a second to look at that cartoon and think of what it's telling us. Yes, we have free trade. Yes, it makes some people really happy. But there is some roadkill on the road to free trade, right? There is some, some loss that's in there, or at least that's arguably in there. American workers get laid off. We saw that. And foreign workers also end up working for very low wages, often in very terrible working conditions. Right? So, how does this work on the American end? Does free trade really hurt jobs? Well, this is American jobs in the manufacturing sector over the last, I don't know, what is that, 30 or 35 years? Notice, this is where NAFTA happened. <coughs> So it's kind of hard to deny, right? Like it's right there on the graph. And if it's in a graph, it's got to be true, right? It's right there in the graph that pretty soon after NAFTA came into place, American manufacturing jobs declined, right? A lot of those auto workers lost their job. Mexican auto workers got jobs. Maybe there are a couple Americans who, who learned Spanish and moved to Mexico, but it definitely hurt 
American manufacturing workers. All right, but there's another hand, right? The overall employment picture is a little bit different, and it's a little bit more inconclusive. This, and here's the difference, right? These are manufacturing jobs. What's here? Well, this is an overall rate of employment, right? What percentage of the population is employed in any given year? Well, you notice on that scale, things are a little bit more variable. Now, uh, there's where NAFTA is. And so, indeed, we have slightly lower employment now than we did then. But it's hard to say that that's because of NAFTA. This is the financial crisis, right? That might be really the thing that did in the American worker. In fact, right after NAFTA was put into place, jobs went up. And in fact, historically, even now, even after the financial crisis, we have more jobs than we did in the distant past. Right? So again, you can have arguing over the one hand and the other hand, which chart do you believe? Now, of course, what nobody's talking about is this guy. It might actually be his fault that manufacturing jobs disappeared. Who's he? He's the robot. He's mechanization, right? He's technology. And technology has probably put a whole lot of workers out of work, not NAFTA. But that's where you get into the this and the that. That's where you get into to, to, to people on either side of the issue. Sure, that the, that the loss in American manufacturing jobs is due only to those robots and not at all to NAFTA. Yeah, people say that with a certain confidence. They might be right, but where they're wrong is in the confidence with which they say it, because they don't know, right? And then, of course, you have other people who say they are sure that American manufacturing lost its jobs because of NAFTA? Well, probably a little bit. But again, they're not wrong in so much in saying it, but in the, in the confidence with which they say it, as if they know, uh, you know something that the rest of us don't. Of course, there's also the argument that free trade hurts people in the developing world. Right, that is just a, a veil for exploitation of the developing world. And certainly things are bad there, too, sometimes. Right? If you work in a country where you're paid by the day instead of by the hour, that looks to some people like exploitation. Right? And so you get opponents of free trade who say that free trade just allows us to exploit people on other continents instead of right here at home. Of course, there's an on the other hand. The on the other hand is that those people aren't forced to work for their low wages. If a Mexican person decided that $4 a day wasn't enough money, that person could decide not to take the $4 a day and not work. And if that happened enough, the factories would have to start paying more. And so just by working for $4 a day, those Mexican workers are saying they prefer the $4 a day to sitting at home. And so how can you call that exploitation, right? Nobody was forced to trade a chocolate. If you did it, you did it because you wanted to, and that means that you got better off as a result. Now, of course, some of this exploitation is really bad, and it's really bad in everybody's eyes, right? Uh, these countries where, where labor is cheap are often countries where they don't have regulations on what age you have to be to work, and so children work, right? They don't have safety regulations. They don't have environmental regulations, at least not to the same degree. Again, the arguments come in the other way as well. Is it better to work for some wage at all rather than none at all? Well, that's now a tough question, right? Here you've got a, a, a cartoon that sort of gets at that issue. Take a second to read it. <laughs> right? So how do you tell poor people in, in, in developing countries who want a job when they have none at all, even if it's a low-paying job, that somehow we think you shouldn't work for that low amount of money. We think it's better that you not work at all. That's a really tough argument to tell anybody, and it's a really tough argument to tell somebody in a country that really doesn't have a whole lot of other opportunities. Right? And so there you go. Right? There's the on the other hand and on the one hand. This is an ongoing debate, and if you want to ask me how I feel about it, I, I mean, I have my opinions and I have my thoughts on this, and, 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 but, but I, I actually believe that nobody's an idiot here. 
right? I think they're very smart people who have really serious reservations about free trade. They're also really smart people who think that free trade is a really good thing. And it's not that they're wrong. The people, you want to know who I think is wrong in this debate? It's the people who talk with total confidence that their side is right and that the other side is wrong, right? The only right answer to me is the acknowledgement that you might actually be mistaken. And so that's sort of my view on free trade. Yeah, questions? Well, okay. Thank you. Questions? We got a few minutes. I talked for longer than I expected to. Yeah, it's not international trade, but it, it definitely is a form of protectionism, right? You can use your money as a state to lower taxes on industry that will come there, right? And then you get more jobs, but you're getting jobs through government intervention. Now, you don't hear these free marketeers complaining so much about that, right? But that's sort of a, it's one of those hidden forms of protectionism, right? When a southern state says, you know what, we're going to just not tax businesses that come here. Well, then when those businesses do well, are they doing well because they pay less wages? Well, well, yes. But in a way, it also hurts the state, right? Because now the state has to forego that tax revenue. And if, if the state's played it all in terms of free trade, maybe those jobs wouldn't have moved there in the first place. And what kind of bothers me a little is that you get this sort of like, it's the advocates of free trade, right? Business people, right? Who are going to say, and now we should cut taxes to some arbitrarily low, e low level just to bring in factories, right? It's this whole like, you know, everybody will call the Democrats fans of welfare, and, and maybe they are. And Republicans are also corporate welfare. They love it, <laughs> right? And so there's welfare on both sides. The question, I mean, what is welfare? Welfare is when the government collects your tax money and gives it to poor people. Well, uh, basically for doing nothing. Well, corporate welfare is when the government takes your tax money and gives it to rich people, basically for doing nothing, right? So there's a little bit of an inconsistency on both sides. Is that a, an answer? It also becomes sort of a problem because, of course, some states want to lower their taxes to bring in businesses, but then the other state wants to do it too, and you essentially get trade wars between states, right, continually lowering their, lowering their taxes to try to attract businesses. Yeah. Yeah. So isn't that a potential, do you think a potential threat to, to countries if they were allowed to go all the way to you know, diversification? That's right. In the end of this, it is a complete lack of diversification. If you follow this to its logical extreme, people will not make maple syrup in the United States. They will only make wine, even me in my backyard. I'll cut down those maple trees, I'll grow wine, and that'll be better. Maybe. I mean, there might be pockets in the United States where it's still better to make maple syrup than wine. So, so it's not going to happen completely. Um, but yes, so uh, we specialize in wine. They specialize in maple syrup. But so long as we keep trade up, well, there's no problem. In fact, a lot of people will say that an extra benefit of free trade is better international relations. Because if we're reliant on Canada for their, their maple syrup, and Canada's reliant on us for wine, the last thing we're going to do is go to war. Because if we go to war, well, our people are going to lose maple syrup, and then they're going to riot, right? And, this, and if the Canadians lose their wine, they're going to riot, right? 
Now, it's not like US, you know, the US and Canada were on the brink of warfare <laughs> anyway, but France and Germany did just this after World War II. When they started the European Union, the, the very idea was that the Germans had cheap coal, the French had the pro processes to make good cheap steel, but they needed coal to, to power their steel industry, right? And they said, well, we've tried to kill each other twice now in the last 50 years, let's go a different way here, right? If we trade with each other, we don't have to conquer each other's territory. And they haven't gone to war since, right? So there's an argument that with free trade, you actually get more world peace. And, and assuming you think that's a good thing, I'm a political scientist, I'm not here to be normative and tell you that world peace is a good thing, but if you think world peace is a, is a good thing, well, well then that's another argument in sort of the, the quiver of free trade uh, loyalists. Anything else? Well good, go out and trade. Like go make lots of money and then give it to Wabash. <laughs> <laughs>